Welcome to our session on overcoming health disparities and the access to care, the challenges that breast cancer patients have. I'm Kathy Cole. I'm delighted to have my colleagues with me today, Mr. Woody Brokenburr, and he's from the National Coalition for Cancer Survivorship, Amanda Zuck, she is from the American Cancer Society, Kayo Matsumoto from the Cancer Support Community, and Teresa Seeley, Executive Director from the Caneo Free Clinic. Welcome to all of you. This is going to be a wonderful session today. We all have parts to play, and I'm looking forward to a very good conversation about this topic. Uh, firstly, I just want to say when we're looking at disparities, in all the research I've done, and maybe we can talk about this, there are four basic pillars to inequities that we see even today in healthcare. And I just want to put them out to you as a starting point. Um, four major things healthcare coverage, access to care, the social determinants of health, and implicit bias. So I think, Woody, could you start us off by explaining to us the differences? and compare and contrast inequality and inequity. Okay. First, let's start with the definition of health equity. According to the World Health Organization, equity is the absence of avoidable, unfair, or treatable differences among groups of people, whether those groups are defined socially, economically, geographically, demographically, or by any other stratification. Health equity or equity of health implies that ideally everyone should have a fair opportunity to attain their full health potential and that no one should be at disadvantage from achieving that, this potential. Um, health equity as defined by Kamara Jones of the Morehouse School of Medicine is the assurance of the condition of optimal health for all people. She noted that this differs from health equity um, people 2020 definition, which says that health equity is the attainment of the highest level of health for all people. The ultimate goal is that health equity should be seen as a process rather than a final outcome. Okay, so Amanda, maybe you could step in here and explain the social determinants of health. Uh, I know you have a great background in, in public health and in the field, so I'm wondering how this might hamper the achievement we can have in health equity given the, determin the social determinants of health. Yeah, so I'd like to, to speak to a little bit of, of the background of how these social determinants of health were developed. So the um, United States Department of Health and Human Services in 2000 created um, the Healthy People 2010, which was a nationwide health promotion uh, and disease prevention goal. Um, and every 10 years, they set out to reevaluate uh, those goals. So we are currently in the Healthy People 2020 cycle currently. Um, the social determinants of health are social, economic, mental, physical um, conditions in the environment in which people are born, live, learn, work, play, worship, and age that affect the range of health, uh, functioning, and quality of life outcomes and risks. Um, when you hear social determinants, you often hear the term health disparity. And what that means is it refers to a particular health difference um, that is linked with social, economic, and or environmental disadvantages that a person or a population may face. Um, you also may hear the term health inequity, uh, which refers to a rate or um, distribution of a difference of a disparity. So an example of a health inequity is when you uh, look at uh, breast cancer rates within the African American population for women. And we'll touch more on that later. And within each category of health, uh, social determinants of health, um, there are definitions and resources that can help enhance the quality of life. Some examples of the social determinants of health uh, are housing, um, access to education, public safety, availability of healthy foods, local emergency um, health services, and environmental 
um, and life-threatening toxins. So many organizations work together to address these social determinants of health based off of how their programs and services um, can help the populations they serve. Okay, so you know, this brings up a couple of good points, and this is why Kayo and Teresa are so important to this conversation. Two things come to mind for me. One is the hospital's required to do a community needs assessment every three years and take a look at our community. And things that keep coming up over and over again is challenges and barriers to care, which as navigators and colleagues in the field, we're trying to mitigate some of these things. I mean, everybody thinks that we live in this wealthy, well-to-do community, and there's a complete underclass of people, which I know, Teresa, you're going to address for us. But the community needs assessment, the same things come up. Transportation, housing, how to get to access to physicians, especially after a diagnosis. So one of the things that have come up in 2019, 2020, and I think we're going to see much more of this in the age of the COVID pandemic is the psychosocial aspects of this. And I know, Kayo, you at the um, um, cancer support community, you do quite a bit of this work. So I'm wondering if you can tell us, are we in sync with our mission of keeping the community needs assessment current? And are we reaching out to you, Teresa, the American Cancer Society? What are we doing for linkages between us and the hospital side so that we can address these barriers? Um, thank you, Kathy. And uh, so Cancer Support Community, um, we have services in a broader national level and community levels. And in uh, national level, we have a research and training institute, and uh, we do lots of research because, uh, like Amanda said, that um, uh, social determinants of health, uh, understanding it is very critical. Um, the standard uh, medical data does not include or the uh, marginalized, social marginalized uh, group of people are uh, often not represented in standard uh, medical data. So we do research on uh, um, uh, the marginalized uh, group a lot. And then, uh, for example, um, financial toxicity is a very, very critical issue. And um, uh, Cancer Support Community did a study uh, last year to explore the biggest barriers uh, to health care for cancer patients. And we found that the largest challenges are uh, treatment cost and delay of cancer care because of treatment cost and uh, lack of conversation uh, about uh, treatment cost. And um, uh, uh, one out of five people, 22% of people uh, surveyed said that they chose not to get some of their health care because of a high out-of-cost, uh, uh, out-of-pocket cost. And 18% uh, of people surveyed said that the cost uh, prevented them from filling prescription drugs necessary to their cancer care. And uh, as much as 60% of people surveyed said that they did not discuss uh, cancer treatment cost with their healthcare providers before the treatment starts, meaning seven out of 10 people go into treatment without knowing what they are going to pay out of pocket. Now this is really interesting because you're talking mostly about people who still have insurance and are the, worried about deductibles, co-pays, prescription drugs, things like that. Whereas Teresa's population, many of them are underserved, uh, underinsured, or uninsured completely. So we as navigators, the, the financial toxicity, it actually, I have patients that have been sent to collections and then call us and say, what can you do to help me? And I have had to talk to collectors. I've had to talk to providers. Mm -hmm. You know, we've actually had some of the patient's expenses erased, but this is not a sustainable way to help people get the cancer treatment they need. So Teresa, you see a kind of different population, but I bet your statistics are fairly uh, in line with Kayo's. Right. Uh, this group is outlining some very definite challenges. Um, our clients would be patients that are uninsured or underinsured. So many of them have maybe emergency care or they have such a high copayment and deductible that it, it 
prevents them from going to get preventative care. And some of them maybe are even service workers who are in and out of work. So one month they have coverage, the next month they don't. One of the saddest things that I've seen in my career there at the Conejo Free Clinic is patients will have a finding and they wait because they, they explained to me that they thought, well, they hoped it would go away because if it was something serious, they feared that they could not afford the treatment to take care of it, and so they waited. So they, it, you know, it was crossed between fear and not having an understanding of the resources. Um, certainly what we can do at the clinic with, with our diagnostic testing to expedite their care and teach them through advocacy and move them along to the next phase, you know, all of that is unknown to them and, and they're locked in fear and not doing anything and precious time is ticking away. So I know we're talking in 2020 now, this probably was always an issue, but I'm always interested in the impact of the pandemic. So I'm wondering, even yesterday, in a long conversation I had with a patient who has insurance, is doing well, needs to have radiation oncology after a partial mastectomy. Mm -hmm. She's too afraid to go to radiation oncology because she doesn't know the safety of the office or the yeah. protocols that they have in place to keep her safe in order to have the treatment necessary. So how do you, in your clinic setting, how do you address this ability to reassure patients mm -hmm. Uh, yes, we can help you, and yes, we can refer you, mm -hmm. and yes, you'll be safe to do this. Mm -hmm. Well, that's a really good point in our ever-changing landscape that we're all experiencing and everybody is so stressed out. Um, when the patients call, the frontline receptionist will explain what we have set up in the way of, you know, we have a doorbell that, that when they come to the clinic, they're the only ones that are going to be in the lobby at that given time. We all have our PPE, they will be screened, and then they will be roomed so they won't be exposed to any other patients. The only other person that they'll see would be a nurse, one-on-one, -on -one, and then the physician, one-on-one. -on -one. But it certainly can understand all of our fear, and, and the numbers have gone down for us at our clinic for this very reason. I'm also thinking in terms of people that have been furloughed or jobs that just are not available anymore. So we have a greater inequity, I think, because more people are going to lose insurance. Mm -hmm. And I'm wondering in future now, and we have to project because we don't know where this pandemic is going. Mm -hmm. We don't know the length of time for vaccine development mm -hmm. and general distribution. But I'm wondering, we're going to see more people underinsured or uninsured mm -hmm. because of the economic and employment situation we see even in this community. Yeah, absolutely. That is the next step. And, and we, of course, as leaders in our community are thinking about that already. Uh, I recall in 2009 was like the height of the economic downturn at that time. And we were seeing upwards of 5,000 people at our clinic. Now, when affordable health care came along, our numbers went down a bit and leveled. Now they're down because of the obvious fears with COVID, but you're right. It's going to come back up, and it might look very much like it did in 2009. And I think we're probably going to end up seeing more in the way of diagnostic workup for delayed diagnoses. This is my biggest fear. Uh, we have the potential to see 10,000 more deaths in breast cancer, probably because screening has been delayed, treatment has been delayed mm -hmm. for a number of reasons that drive that. Mm -hmm. So Woody, as somebody who's sort of an advocate in the field, um, how do you see any kind of sustainable program? Do you see any way through and recommendations of what can be done with all of our organizations to do something that is really making a difference in all of these moving parts that we're going to continue to see? Well, I think that first we need to abate fear. I mean, there's just so much fear. I, I feel fearful myself when I look at 
the news. I look at all the things that are happening. Stop watching the news. Yeah, <laughs> I know. And, um, and I, I think um, when you look at the, the way that nonprofits are being stretched um, because of contributions, you know, that, that's a, a, another challenge that we have to face. But I think collectively, um, as organizations, we have to um, keep reaching out to patients. Um, and we have to, as advocates, is to, to be out there letting people know that we're here to support them. Yeah, and community outreach is really tough right now because there's so much of social distancing, masks. You know, when we talk about inherent bias, mm -hmm. implicit bias, everyone's everyone's got a bias and I was listening to a webinar the other night it was fascinating and she said listen don't think that you have racist tendencies or that you're a biased person think of it as you're a human being and we function this way we categorize this way mm -hmm. and so now we have to distance ourselves with masks physical distance and we still have to put trust in a relationship for treatment and diagnostic work that's just going to be challenging even for us as as providers and as advocates in the field yeah yeah i, I on the conference call that we had um i think it was yesterday and um, there was an example where a person had discovered they had a mass oh yes and they were just you know they were so apprehensive about coming to a health care provider that um, when they finally did show up, it was already, you know, kind of in the stages of, of being um, a bad thing. So, yeah, I mean, it, it, it's a lot, and um, I, don't, <laughs> I don't know what the answer is. It's such Not a sure period of uncertainty. One. Yeah, I think it's going to be a collaborative effort everywhere. Um, Amanda, from the Cancer Society perspective and what you're seeing. Yeah, I think this... What we're talking about is the social determinant of uh, access to health care, which you mentioned in the beginning. And it is important for all of us as community partners to get together to assess what is the barrier to that access. And it's important for us to then come up with measures and initiatives to figure out how we can address that for our community and for our patients. I think that's a place that we start. Um, I think that is going to be new to most of us because we haven't handled what that looks like in a pandemic. Um, but I think that's a place that we start in terms of addressing this social determinant to access to health care. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. uh, please. Um, I just I wanted to say additionally, just a footnote, what Amanda said um, is that when you think about the social determinants and you think about um, COVID has really sort of taken a bandage off of, of the social disparities. Um, it, it is it's really glaring. Um, I think that we're challenged now, but we have an opportunity yes. to, um, to learn from what's happening now and to make sure that strategically and in planning that we have, um, we think about stop gut measures so that we don't, we're not caught like this again. Mm -hmm. um, so, um, it, COVID's been a, a, a wake-up call, I think. I, I think you're quite right, and I think maybe from the grassroots and the local has to have some control over this, but we also have to have sort of a federal mandate, so I think there's a part to play in every, in every situation to make a sustainable program because this has shown society disparities that have been covered over for a long, long time and there won't be one answer. It'll probably be collaborative. Maybe they're gonna to have to be task forces that are created at a level that can be statewide, nationwide. I, don't, I think we have to determine this. We're in an election year too, so we really don't know where policy is gonna go in the future. Right. But very good point to those inequities. Kayo, do you see more, um, I guess, stress, thinking locally, have you seen anything different in our community that maybe you hadn't anticipated before and then you had to create something? So I, I, for an example, I, I happen to know that you just started a new support group mm -hmm. for 
Spanish speaking monolingual yes. women and I think maybe we need to look at language as a potential barrier absolutely and do we have appropriate providers and facilitators to address this yes and you know, so we uh, our uh, programs and services include you know, uh, Spanish language uh, support groups and uh, um, bilingual kids support and family dinner um, the culturally uh, sensitive uh, programs and you know, we recently um, had an intern who is bilingual and uh, bicultural and uh, she is uh, she has been trained with uh, critical uh, critical race theory so uh, this is uh, a very interesting um, next step for us because uh, as a mental health clinician myself, you know, we have to start um, from educating ourselves yes. uh, to treat you know, people, all people. And uh, mental health, uh, like Amanda said, in um, uh, social uh, determinants of health, you know, mental health is a critical issue among uh, cancer patients. And uh, cancer impacts not only our bodies, but our minds and the feelings of anxiety, um, depression, and the fear of uh, death is, uh, are very common among um, uh, cancer patients. And not to mention that uh, many of them are uh, experiencing another layer of distress because of COVID-19 pandemic. Mm -hmm. And um, studies show that uh, untreated mental health issues may have uh, worse cancer-related outcomes. And uh, cancer patients with mental health issues are less likely to follow um, medical treatments and um, uh, appointments and prevention screening. And they also have less, um, less and, uh, they also exercise less and drink more alcohol and uh, use other substances. Mm. So we really need to address you know, mental, mental health issues of uh, cancer patients. So, Teresa, are you seeing any of this, too, in your population of patients? You know, it says that when you look at patients that may fail to come in for an appointment, they have continuous no-show appointments, find out what that is before you want to label the patient for not being compliant. That sometimes there's just not a fit between the healthcare provider and the patient, and there's a barrier that gets set up there because of our uh, insensitivity, not that anybody would overtly do anything that was unpleasant to a patient, but what do you see at the clinic level in terms of relationship building between your providers and your patient population? It's a really interesting and good question. Um, I think historically, my experience with patients when they come to a free clinic, you know, a lot of them are quite embarrassed. Many of them have never had to use a free clinic before. It was really important to me in the early years of my work there at the clinic that everybody is treated with respect and just because it's a free clinic doesn't mean it, it is substandard in any way. And it, it, we kind of changed the culture, but to answer your question, the, the patients that are coming in, I mean, across the board, they do come in with the feeling that they've already been kicked around a bit, that they already feel that they deserve maybe less than because they're poor or they're at a free clinic. And so uh, from the very start, it, we work with them to let them know that we're proud that, to help them and they need to be proud that they're there getting the help that they need. Um, so, you know, just as a free clinic leader, that is, you know, historically and continues to be, you know, uh, an ongoing theme for my, my patients. Mm -hmm. And so do we see anything between advocacy in the field, the American Cancer Society, the cancer support community, the free clinic, do we see interactions between all of our organizations? Do we refer to one another? Do we stay connected in some kind of network for patients? What, what's our process? So I can, I'd like to answer part of that. Please. Um, for, so obviously we can do so much at the, 
at the Conejo Free Clinic, and we're very fortunate that we're able to do a lot of diagnostic testing, especially in the area of cancer, where we can do the diagnostic mammogram, biopsy, and even the DNA sensitivities, so that by the time it's time to move them into likely the county system, they are armed with all of their, their uh, diagnoses, all of their pathology, and that will help the doctor at, at the next step to get moving. And so this is a great help. So uh, I'm really pleased that through the years, we have developed inroads with county they understand the work we do, we understand the work they do. Um, if I have a patient with a cancer and we've done all that we can do and, and we're ready to move them on, my medical director, Dr. Frank Dawson, will call oncology in the county, introduce the patient, and the patient goes right in. Instead of having to maybe repeat tests, yeah. or, and Kathy also is helpful uh, on our team while our patients wait in the interim when the pathology tests are coming back. She'll give them a call and, and while they're waiting, she'll explain what the findings are and what they might expect in the weeks and, and days coming up. So I think that's huge. It's a beautiful way to, to facilitate patients in a, in a crisis in a very caring, respectful way. Good, and it takes a village to take care of sure cancer enough. patients. Yeah. <laughs> Um, we cover psychosocial support for cancer patients, cancer survivors, and their families. And you know, we do support groups and educational workshops and uh, healthy lifestyle uh, stress reduction classes. And you know, they're all at no cost to our participants. And uh, because of the generous donation in, uh, from the community, you know, we can provide like you, your programs, our programs are free of charge. And uh, we work closely with cancer, American Cancer Society, and you know, we receive uh, fax. <laughs> we still use you know, fax um, referral um, sheets from American Cancer Society, and you know, we call those people within 48 hours. And you know, we also started um, early stage, uh, newly diagnosed breast cancer support group, uh, because again, you know, we listen to the community's uh, needs. All our uh, support groups are uh, professionally facilitated, meaning uh, mental health uh, licensed professionals uh, facilitate those groups. So um, we have three uh, breast cancer support groups, including newly diagnosed and survivorship and uh, advanced breast group uh, support group. In terms of collaboration, the American Cancer Society has worked closely with Los Robles and the navigators and physicians here uh, to help patients with transportation, uh, any sort of potential financial barriers or financial resources, as well as patient education. Uh, we have a lot of resources and references towards uh, education related to diagnosis and treatment, um, as well as with many of our events that we host locally. Uh, we've also worked closely with cancer support community. Uh, I know I personally uh, send out to all my connections and all the volunteers we work with locally, all the support groups that are happening. Um, we've worked with referring patients for transportation as well. So I know the community collaboration between our organizations is strong and only growing stronger. Great. The National Coalition, uh, coalition uh, yeah. for Cancer Survivorship um, really is the advocate for cancer um, mm -hmm. patients, when those have been diagnosed and those are currently going through treatment. Mm -hmm. uh, one thing I, I wanted to highlight is just the number of cancer, survi um, ca cancer survivors. Right now, they're about 13.7 million, and in 10 years, um, that number is going up to 18 million. So, you know, you, you got this whole population of people that you need to care and you need to advocate for. Um, some of the things um, that we found um, in our research for the challenges um, for cancer survivors would be um, physical, medical, um, when you're talking about pain or fatigue, uh, memory problems, lymphedemia, sexual impairment, and as for me, amputation um, mm -hmm. as a cancer survivor. Mm -hmm. the, the second is the psychosocial. You know, people are dealing with depression, anxiety, uncertainty, isolation, and because once you have cancer, I, I think sometimes it alters your self-image. 
Yeah. Um, then third is the social, um, which um, Kayo has talked about, the changes in interpersonal relationships, mm -hmm. concerns regarding health or life insurance, um, job loss, um, financial burden, and then um, existential and spiritual issues, you know, the sense of purpose, of meaning, appreciation of life. And then finally, resource coordination, um, establish a patient navigation model that um, will direct patients to the care that they need. That's great. Do you follow the navigation model started by um, Dr. Freeman in Harlem? Yes, yes. Yeah. So he's like the grandfather of all navigation. Exactly. Yeah. You know, one thing, I, um, I was on a conference call with Dr. Otis Brawley. Oh, yes. You know, you know him? I he do. was with the American Cancer Society yeah. now. He's with John Hopkins. Um, he said that if all Americans had um, health insurance of a college-educated American, that 22% less people would die. And so that translates to 132,000 Americans um, deaths that would occur. Wow, what does that say? Yeah. <laughs> so what is it you think when we talk about all of this networking, and I think we've touched on all the four pillars of what we see in terms of disparities of the health care coverage, the access to care, the social determinants of health, and implicit bias. I'd like you all to, you know, summarize then, and please plug away, tell us how people can get involved in each of your organizations so that this becomes an educational moment for those who are listening. Um, they could go to canceradvocacy.org. Mm -hmm. And um, it's a very detailed um, website, uh, has a resource um, um, drop down schedule, um, drop down tab rather, mm -hmm. to, um, to lead you to all type of um, research or publications, um, navigate a navigation tool for treatment. And um, there's also, I'm, I'm a part of what's called Stephen Ministry, and they've written a book on you know, so you have cancer, and it, it really is a detail. I don't, I don't mean to plug. <laughs> it's, a, it's a detail um, roadmap as to, you know, how you can advocate, for, ha advocate for yourself, and um, you know, some of the the things that you may be feeling to say that you're not alone. So. I think that's real important because we're together but apart <laughs> yeah. in in many aspects of trying to care for patients today. Exactly. Thanks. Yeah, thank you. In terms of ad advocating, I would recommend if you want to get involved with the American Cancer Society, there are many ways to volunteer. You can reach out to our 800 number uh, to figure out what those volunteer opportunities are. You could reach out to your local American Cancer Society organization and staff partners to learn more about those opportunities. Uh, we also have the American Cancer Society Cancer Action Network, ACS CAN. They are a advocacy organization that fights local policy as well as federal policy on behalf of cancer patients uh, and prevention. You can get involved with them and volunteer with them. I would also just encourage everyone to try and understand the difference between inequality and inequity. Uh, E equality is, is giving everyone an equal opportunity, whereas equity is giving everyone the need that they personally need. So if you look at the slide that we have, um, you'll see an image of, for equity, giving everybody a bicycle who might need a bicycle for transportation, whereas equity is giving someone who has a wheelchair a bicycle that matches a wheelchair bicycle so that they can have access to their transportation need for their disability or giving a child a child bicycle versus just a general bicycle. So I'd encourage everyone to understand the difference between equality and equity um, because it, it's a major difference and it really helps us understand um, humanity and all the social determinants that we all face. Um, yeah. 
Cancer Support Community um, continue to provide you know, free of charge programs, uh, support groups, and stress reduction classes, educational workshops. And if you go to our website, cancersupportvvsb.org, you can uh, browse all the uh, programs. And also we have a Cancer Support Helpline. The helpline number is 888 um, 793-9355. Uh, this uh, cancer support helpline provides you know, financial navigation, housing resources, cancer coping assistance, and uh, specialized information such as pediatric cancer care information and uh, clinical trials. And because of the pandemic, you know, all our programs are virtual programs. And uh, when we go back to in-person programs, we will continue to provide online support groups because you know, no matter where you live in our service area, um, they can still join our uh, services and they can still um, come to our support groups, whether they live in Reseda or Santa Paula or Fillmore. So we will continue That's to provide to have that hybrid, model. hybrid yes, good. and a hybrid model. Yeah. And so some programs will continue to be online. Great. The Caneo Free Clinic is a 501c3. We uh, receive no government or state funding, so we rely on grants and donations and the efforts of our volunteers. I have five paid staff. Um, so we have the ways to get involved and to help support the clinic and the patients we serve. Uh, we have a, a Friends of the Caneo Free Clinic, which is a giving club to support uh, our, our, the funding. Um, we have a we're trying to rebuild our volunteer base now because many of our volunteers have have stopped coming because of COVID. So mm -hmm. as we look to the future, we will be looking for doctors, nurses, and front uh, support staff. I think um, one of the most important messages I'd like to give is that no matter where you are in your organization, if you have a patient, if you have a person that's struggling and you're not sure and you think that certainly they would go beyond the scope of care of the Caneo Free Clinic or they have means or they don't have means, they're homeless or wherever they are, we're, we are so passionate with patient advocacy, they can call me and I will hear what the situation is and we'll piece it together and then we'll find the best and most appropriate avenue for them to go and we'll take them every step of the way until they don't need us anymore. They can call me at 805-551-5266 and we also are on the web at caneofreeclinic.org. That's wonderful. So I want to thank you all for this wonderful conversation. I think we have hope in our future. I think we have the passion for the mission, and I think we have every reason to hope that we can make some vital change in the breast cancer patient, in advocacy for cancer in general, and particularly because, as Woody had mentioned about looking at the greater social inequities that the pandemic has created for us, we can really now take a deep dive and make society a better place by having all of us do our part, particularly for those most vulnerable. So I want to thank you again for joining us today and see you in the field as always. Thank you.